We turn now to former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Her book is Oath, An Honor, A Memoir, and a Warning. Good morning to you here. Good morning, Margaret. Great to be with you. I want to give you a chance to respond to the speaker. Is it a fact, as he asserted, that when you were in House leadership, you considered signing on to that challenge to Donald Trump? It is not. Uh, we were, as Mike said, in constant contact throughout that period. I actually know precisely when he sent me the brief and precisely when, less than 30 minutes later, I told him uh, my concerns with the brief. Mike knows that as well. Uh, the brief itself was, was uh, legally and constitutionally infirm. Uh, I made that clear. Mike's claims that somehow, and, and this is very dangerous, that somehow, uh, as a member of Congress, he has the right to reject, ignore the rulings of the courts. You know, we have dozens of state and federal courts that uh, assessed the claims, uh, assessed the constitutionality, and rejected them. And Mike's position, which, which people really need to think about because it's so chilling, is that somehow, as a member of Congress, he has the right to ignore the rulings of those courts, to assert, absent any fa finding of fact, um, that somehow he feels that, that something that happened was unconstitutional, and therefore, that he can throw out the votes of millions of Americans. That's tyranny. It's not the rule of law, it's tyranny. And, and it's important for people to understand that because this notion of rejecting, ignoring, refusing to abide by the rulings of the courts is also what we will see in a, in a second Trump term if Donald Trump is reelected. And you write extensively about this in your book and you say it was actually Donald Trump's own lawyers who wrote that legal brief that Speaker Johnson circulated. Correct. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, he, Johnson, and I made this clear to him too, uh, the very first time we spoke after I reviewed the brief, um, that he was misrepresenting the brief to the members of the conference. I also told him that I thought that signing on to this brief for anyone who was a member of a bar raised significant and serious ethical issues because you were asserting to a court facts uh, that not only were untrue, but which had already been rejected by other courts and for which you had no basis and no knowledge. So he, he knows the truth, but the American people, beyond the dis disagreement between uh, Johnson and I, need to recognize how dangerous it is to have elected officials who think they can ignore the rulings of the courts. And so for, for those folks who, who say, oh, this sounds very complicated, the, one of the reasons we're talking about this is because the members of the House Republican leadership signed on to it. Correct. All of the members of the House Republican leadership supported Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election and currently are endorsing him to be the next president of the United States. Right. So from your perspective, it sounds like you're saying you don't trust Republican leadership in the House and their conduct in the upcoming election. Look, they, you've had two members of Republican leadership in the House on television this morning. You've had Mike on, again, claiming that he has the right individually to decide that he's going to throw out millions of votes and ignore the rulings of the courts. You've had Elise Stefanik on this morning talking about the J6 hostages. Um, I mean, you don't have to take my word for the fact that you can't count on these elected Republicans to defend the Constitution, every time they go out and give an interview, they demonstrate it themselves. Now, Elise Stefanik was on another network this morning. You just mentioned her. The quote was, I have concerns about the treatment of the January 6th hostages. Hostages is a very specific word. And there are well over 1,200 people in the U.S. legal system going through legal proceedings right now for their role in the attack that day. That word she used is exactly the word that Donald Trump uses. And that's why she's using it. And it's outrageous and it's disgusting. And if you, if you go and you look at what individuals have been convicted for uh, who are incarcerated, uh, you'll find uh, you know, extensively, these are people who were involved in violence against police officers, uh, in the assault on the Capitol. Uh, and it is really, it's disgraceful for Donald Trump to be saying what he's saying, and then for those uh, who are attempting to enable him or attempting to further their own political careers to repeat it, it's a disgrace. And you cannot say that you are uh, a member of, of a party that believes in the rule of law. You can't say that you're pro-law enforcement if you then go out and you say these people are, quote, hostages. It's, it's disgraceful. We have other Republican candidates for president, like Ron DeSantis, who have said they are open to reviewing the cases against these defendants and considering pardons for them. Look, you know, the president has, has pardon power and pardon authority. 
I think that uh, it's a very important piece that people ought to consider when they're thinking about for whom they're going to vote. Uh, someone who says that they would pardon individuals who assaulted the Capitol, who attempted to stop a constitutional process, uh, who uh, assaulted police officers. I mean, it was a bloody battle. I had police officers, one, tell me that it was, it was like medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, the notion that the Republican Party would continue its efforts to whitewash that day, mm -hmm. when the, the peaceful transition of power is at the core of the survival of our republic, yeah. tells you that they're unfit for office. We have to take a break, but I want to come back with you on the other side of it. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We return to our conversation with former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Um, the Supreme Court is going to take on that Colorado case uh, where the state was going to remove him from the ballot, citing insurrection and the 14th Amendment. The special counsel, Jack Smith, charged Donald Trump with a number of things. Insurrection was not one of them. So given that it doesn't meet that Justice Department standard, um, do you think the Supreme Court will ultimately disqualify Trump? Uh, we'll see what happens in the courts. Um, if, you, if you look at the select committee's work, we made a criminal referral uh, with respect to the part of the 14th Amendment that talks about providing aid and comfort to an insurrection. I certainly believe that Donald Trump's behavior uh, rose to that level. I believe that he ought to be disqualified from holding office in the future. It's working its way through the courts. Um, and in, in the meantime, and in any case, we have to be prepared to ensure that we can defeat him at the ballot box which ultimately I believe we'll be able to do. The Supreme Court uh, may ultimately hear it, but right now the D.C. Circuit will be taking on this question of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution this Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, Lindsey Graham was on this program, the senator, last Sunday, saying no one's immune from prosecution, but presidents do have immunity in order to do their job. And he said Trump just gave a fiery speech. <laughs> As a conservative, what do you make of this and the broader argument that this would be undermining presidential immunity? Look, I think that there's there's no basis for an assertion that, that a president of the United States is completely immune from criminal prosecution for acts in office. Uh, and, and I suspect that that's what the court will hold. I think it's really important for people as, as they're looking at all of this litigation to recognize what Donald Trump's trying to do. He's trying to suppress the evidence. He's trying to delay his trial because he doesn't want people to see the witnesses who'll testify against him. And, and we just saw again this morning news reports that uh, Dan Scavino, Pat Cipollone, testimony that they have apparently given in front of the grand jury um, that once again confirms uh, you know, what we were able to discover in the select committee, confirms that Donald Trump did not want to tell people to go home, did not want to tell the mob to leave the Capitol, that he watched the attack on television. And, and Trump knows that the witnesses in his trial are not his political opponents. He knows that they're going to be the people who are closest to him, the people that he appointed. And he doesn't want the American people to see that evidence before they vote. They have a right to see that evidence before they vote. And so I think it's very important he not be able to, to delay his trial. Very quickly, what do you think of the fact that Secretary uh, Austin has been hospitalized since January 1st and didn't tell the White House until days later? I, I think they've got some very serious explaining to do. I think that there's a, there's a real difference between public transparency and uh, you know, alerting the commander in chief to the fact that the Secretary of Defense is in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the deputy secretary was on vacation in Puerto Rico. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's it's inexplicable. Uh, we need to know more about exactly what happened there, but that's not the way the Pentagon ought to be conducting business. We'll still be asking questions about it. Thank you. Thank you, Good Liz to Cheney. You. Thank you for being here. The very first votes of 2024 will happen next Monday in the Iowa caucus. Our Ed O'Keefe is there. Just over a week to go, and Donald Trump remains confident. Because I always say, how the hell do I lose Iowa? I got the farmers of this country, $28 billion. How the hell do I? The former president is running a far more formidable operation than the first time he ran in the first in the nation caucus. Calling from the Trump team. And Iowa is like the rest of the country, increasingly concerned about the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. What's the sort of number one, number two issue you're worried Close about? Close the border. Immigration. Immigration. Or the border for sure. 
With more migrants being sent north and west to big cities, most Americans now oppose providing temporary housing and social services in the areas where they live. So all these millions of people that have nowhere to live and that our system cannot support, we are not helping these people. Another hot topic in Iowa, January 6th. Two-thirds of Republicans nationally support Trump's calls to pardon those who forced their way into the Capitol. Some people call them prisoners. I call them hostages. Release the J6 hostages, Joe. Trump's assault on democracy isn't just part of his past. It's what he's promising for the future. How Trump responded to January 6th and broader concerns about American democracy are now leading themes of President Biden's re-election campaign. They were there with love in their heart. That was an unbelievable and it was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. But while Trump may be leading here in Iowa, that isn't stopping GOP opponents Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, both running hard for second place. That was Ed O'Keefe reporting in Iowa. We go now to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who joins us from Des Moines, Iowa. Good morning to you, Governor. Good morning. You know, when we were in Texas, we saw Florida law enforcement trucks uh, patrolling along that Texas border. I know you've been very supportive of Governor Abbott of Texas. Um, do you think that immigration should be left up to federal authorities, or do you also plan to have Florida try to use its local law enforcement to arrest migrants? Well, uh, when I'm president, uh, we will, of course, it's a federal I issue, a federal interest, but states and lo localities should absolutely be able to supplement the federal government. And we're in a situation now where the federal government asserts under the supremacy clause of the Constitution that they have the sole dominion over enforcing immigration laws, but they're choosing not to faithfully enforce immigration laws. But supplementing is different than superseding. And as you know, the Supreme Court was asked to weigh in on this in the state of Arizona back in 2012. Are you saying in Florida you're going to use law enforcement to arrest migrants now? What I'm saying is as president, I am going to deputize state and localities. And you're right about that Arizona case. I actually think the Supreme Court would, would reevaluate that today, especially in light of what we've seen. Uh, but as president, I am going to say state and localities have the authority to enforce immigration laws as long as they're upholding the law. It's one thing if a state was trying to frustrate the law. Of course, under the Supremacy Clause, they couldn't do that. But that's not what we have here. It's the federal government that's frustrating the imposition, the, the enforcement of the law. It's the states that just want the law enforced. So there were at least two groups of migrants fleeing Cuba that landed in your state of Florida this past week. But the numbers versus last year are actually way down. Um, the Biden administration said anyone caught at sea will be banned from humanitarian parole programs. Do you believe that the Biden policy has helped Florida? Well, what's helped Florida, uh, Margaret, because the Coast Guard does a good job and they are in charge of that. We started to have a rash of boats coming and there were a lot of gaps because the Coast Guard didn't have enough resources. Uh, so I marshaled state resources, state maritime assets. We filled in the gaps. And so what would happen if you had a boat coming from Haiti, let's say, uh, Florida law enforcement uh, would interdict. We would mm -hmm. have to turn over the, um, the potential illegal aliens to the Coast Guard, but then the Coast Guard would deport them back to Haiti or Cuba or wherever. That had a huge, huge deterrent effect because People are not going to want to go, go over those choppy waters knowing that most likely they're just going to end up back where they came. It's the same principle applied to the southern border. People know if they just get to the border, they're going to get a free pass into the United States. So they're going to be willing to pay thousands of dollars to coyotes and cartels. If we have a new sheriff in town on this and they know they're going back to their home country, you're yeah. going to see a dramatic decrease in people that are going to even try this voyage. Well, let me ask you about that, because you said this past week uh, you would like to deport nearly 8 million undocumented migrants. Um, would you deport those who are waiting asylum legal proceedings before they've had their day in court? Well, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to streamline that. Uh, you know, we're going to do a, a presumption against asylum uh, for the people that come across the border illegally from the from the traditional countries, which, you know, look, America is, is a better place to live than some of those countries, but they just don't qualify for asylum. Uh, so, yes, they will be included. We're going to work through that to make sure that we can streamline it. But the idea you that you, you can need come to, do to that? the southern border. 
Uh, I, I think we can do. I think we could do a lot through executive action. I do think it would be helpful for Congress to do some things on that. And I know the House of Representatives with HR2 is doing that. I would support that. But we have a situation now. You show up at the border, you say the magic words, then they give you a sheet of paper and they say, "Come back in two years. Yeah. Enjoy your stay in America." How is that something that is ever going to get this border under control? And I'll tell you, I'm I'm here in Iowa well, now talking to people in New Hampshire, South Carolina, these early states, they're frustrated with how the federal government will treat people coming into our country illegally better than Americans in some respects. Free free lodging, free transportation. You know, the well, Biden administration was charging people to get out of Israel to take them to Greece. I sent planes to Israel. We, we sent, brought people back free of charge. So yeah. we've got to put the American people in our sovereignty first. Our CBS polling shows half the country expects there will be violence from the side that loses in future elections. Do you share that concern about this race? Oh, I, I hope not. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we have an opportunity. One of, you know, one of the reasons I'm running is I think the Republicans, we have a great shot to win uh, if we frame the issues about uh, the problems facing the country, the failures of the Biden administration, and how we have a great uh, set of ideas to, to turn the country around. And I've shown how that can be done in Florida. Um, I think if we're relitigating the, the past elections, if it's about, you know, Donald Trump or his legal issues or criminal trials or all that stuff, you know, I think it's going to be a really nasty election. I don't think that puts Republicans in a good position to win. Uh, so we, we need to have a, a, an election on the issues. You know, we need a candidate that can win a clear cut victory. Um, and we need to start looking forward as a country. You have never lost a political race before in your career. You are a second in the CBS Iowa projections. Um, is that victory enough for you? Well, we got to win a majority of the delegates. This is a long process. We're doing really well in Iowa. You know, I kind of like being underestimated, Margaret, so I hope people kind of say say that. Uh, but we've got the enthusiasm. When the calendar clicked to 24, you see, we got more undecided voters coming out to all our events. So we're going to outwork everybody. But this is a long process. Uh, there's a lot that happens to accumulate all these delegates. We're going to do well in Iowa, but we're also going to be competing in all these other states. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of real estate. I think a lot of things are going to happen. I wish the former president would actually debate, though. I mean, I think mm -hmm. if you're going to stand for nomination, you should be able to stand on a stage to do it. I'm happy to debate him on your program or if your network wants to host a debate in New Hampshire, or South Carolina. Uh, but the idea that he can go and just read off the teleprompter uh, for 45 minutes and then go back, you know, back home, that doesn't cut it in Iowa and that doesn't cut it in a lot of these states. And so uh, let's go get on the stage and, and let's have the, the debate of ideas. And I hope Donald Trump will be willing to do that. We will see. Governor, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. We'll be right back. Maryland Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen spent the last several days in the Middle East. He and Senator Jeff Merkley visited the Rafa crossing between Egypt and Gaza, and he joins us this morning from Amman, Jordan. Uh, Senator, what is the choke point? Why isn't aid making it into Gaza? Well, Margaret, uh, Senator Merkley and I went to the Rafa crossing to find out exactly uh, that question. Uh, there are two big things uh, that are happening. One is the unnecessarily cumbersome process uh, going through the Israeli screening uh, process, uh, which I believe is the result of uh, political uh, decisions by the Netanyahu uh, coalition. For example, um, many items that are, should be allowed to go into Gaza, water sort of filtration systems, uh, other systems like that, uh, were in a warehouse. Uh, of rejected items that we visited. Uh, while we were there, we saw a truck turned away uh, that had a big box from UNICEF, which is, of course, the UN uh, organization that helps children. Uh, it was a unit to help with water desalinization. Um, it was rejected. And when one item on a truck is rejected, the entire truck uh, is rejected. The other big issue is within Gaza, uh, the so-called deconfliction process, which is just a fancy name for those who are providing humanitarian assistance to have the confidence that they can deliver it, 
uh, without being killed. Uh, and according to all the international NGOs that we talked about who've been operating in conflict zones around the world, uh, they've never seen a worse process uh, for assuring the safe delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, and so that, of course, makes it uh, very difficult uh, to get the help to people who need it, people who are starving um, and where they're on the verge of outbreak of cholera and other diseases. France and Jordan made the decision to airdrop aid in because of those issues going in by land. Should the United States do the same? Well, I think we should consider every means uh, to try to get desperately needed humanitarian assistance uh, in uh, to Gaza. The problem with airdrops is it's just not at scale. In other words, it's good. Uh, but what we need is far more trucks to be able to cross into Gaza. After all, uh, before the war started, you had 500 trucks uh, crossing uh, into uh, Gaza. Uh, and today, you know, this last week, it was around 150 uh, trucks uh, per day. Um, we need to make this a 24-7 operation. Uh, the Israeli screening sites um, are only operating on like an eight hour a day schedule, uh, taking some days off. Uh, this is a 24 seven humanitarian crisis. Um, and we need a system uh, that will recognize that people are, are, are dying every day. Of course, some yeah. uh, from bombs. We have over 22 people dead, two thirds of them women and children, uh, but also this humanitarian crisis. You said you believe aid's not getting in because of a political de decision by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. If that's the case, does that government need to face consequences from the United States, their ally? Yes, I do think there have, been, have to be consequences. Uh, and. You know, Secretary Blinken and President Biden have been right uh, to insist on two things, a reduction uh, in the unacceptable levels of civilian casualties and much more cooperation when it comes to providing uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, we've not seen that. Uh, this is one reason why I and other senators have proposed uh, an amendment that would apply to every country that the United States provides military assistance to, whether it's Ukraine, Israel, or any other country. Uh, that would require that country to cooperate fully with the United States uh, in providing uh, humanitarian assistance in an area of conflict where U.S. provided uh, weapons are being used. Uh, it would also require all recipients of U.S. military assistance uh, to abide by international humanitarian law. These are some basic principles that should be universally applied by the United States. The White House so far has not signed on to that. Um, before I let you go, sir, I want to ask you, since you're coming back to Washington to work, 63 percent of Americans, according to our polling, believe Joe Biden needs to get tougher at the U.S. border. I'm wondering if you are comfortable with provisions that would tighten asylum law and give more expulsion authority to turn away migrants coming to the United States. Well, Margaret, uh, President Biden is well aware of the unacceptable challenges that we're facing right now uh, at the U.S. border, which is why he provided a uh, large number of additional pro proposed additional resources for Border Patrol agents. Uh, as you know, uh, there's a bipartisan group of senators uh, that are discussing various policy changes. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the results of those discussions. Uh, I'm told that both the Democratic Senate caucus and the Republican Senate caucus may be briefed as early as this week mm -hmm. uh, on a framework, al although I don't know for sure. Um, I'm going to have to yeah. look at every proposal uh, before I make any final uh, decision. I can tell you that some of the House yeah. proposals are way too extreme okay. and All undermine right, Senator, Senator, the I'm idea sorry of America. Because of the um, delay, I'm going to have to speak over you and cut you off because of this commercial break. I'm, I apologize, sir. We'll be back in a moment. We toured a federal border facility and a migrant shelter while in Eagle Pass, Texas, to understand the full border picture. Here's what we saw. 
Four-day-old Juan Angel is one of America's newest citizens. We met him and his 26-year-old mother, Leslie, at a temporary shelter the day after they were released from the hospital. She just had an emergency C-section. Are you in pain? Tienes todavía dolor? Yes. But you're smiling. Pero tienes una sonrisa, ¿por qué? <laughs> Thanks to God, everything is okay, she says. After a two-month journey from Honduras with her nine- and four-year-old, Leslie told us she went into labor in the Rio Grande while crossing illegally to the U.S. He is a U.S. citizen now. And that's what you wanted? Yes, that was the plan, she says. Leslie said she came to the U.S. seeking better opportunities, but the road ahead is unclear. She can't take this Texas state-funded bus to a different city since newborns and Americans aren't permitted. Shelters that receive federal funds, like this one, only assist non-citizens, so newborn Juan cannot stay. Some of these asylum seekers have family in the U.S., but there's no federal program to settle them. The average wait for asylum to be granted is four years. There's a backlog of three million pending cases and less than 800 immigration judges to process them. Families make up 40 percent of arrivals in this sector, senior Border Patrol officials told us. This is the facility where migrants are processed. It can hold a maximum of 1,100 people for no more than 72 hours. Many arrive wet from the river and are offered food and dry clothes. They're given mylar blankets, which are resistant to lice, and medical checks. Boys 14 and older are fingerprinted. 60 percent of the migrants now are single adult males, mostly Venezuelans, held in these plexiglass pods. Border Patrol estimates smugglers make $32 million a week in this 242-mile remote border stretch. They target this thinly resourced area. Since September, agents in Eagle Pass apprehended migrants from 61 countries from as far away as Asia, Africa and the Middle East. The FBI is investigating one picked up last week. The agents admit they don't know who they might have missed. They're frustrated that before Christmas, 90 percent of this sector went unpatrolled while they dealt with the crush of illegal entries. What's going to happen to these kids? There are caregivers for the unaccompanied children. This six-year-old boy came on his own from Mexico. These young girls made the dangerous trek from Honduras on their own. And that weighs on the agents that apprehend them. A Border Patrol agent wanted us to know, as he put it, we're not monsters. We have seen a lot of moms that have lost their kids in the, in the river. Valeria Wheeler runs the only shelter in Eagle Pass. She helps as many as 1,200 migrants a day after they're released by Border Patrol. She thinks Congress should make clear the trek isn't worth it. We know that not everybody's going to be granted for asylum, so what's the point of all the struggles that they have to pass through and all the suffering that this is causing? Can America balance the national security risk of a hemisphere-wide crisis while keeping our humanity and stay a nation of immigrants? That's the vexing challenge. That's it for us today. We'll see you next week.